the children in the town come dressed like this on the Friday before the Art Deco Festival. So, so uh, and when I contacted the director of their festival and told him that we were intending to come, he said, well, we're going to host you at all these events. I got to sit with the Admiral of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Navy, with the Mayor of the city. Okay, but he said there's one condition. You have to dress the part. So my wife and I traveled to New Zealand with four suitcases. Two suitcases were just for Art Deco weekend. One of them was hats alone. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you. I have my boater hat today. Barbara, why don't you just? I didn't even think of it. So I just wanted. My wife is dressed as a flat.
because he has a very bad reputation in the United States. Because when the Depression started, he was uh, slow to respond to the circumstances of the Depression. Uh, however, uh, prior to that, he was considered to be a very, very good technocrat. He was in charge of war relief after World War I. Uh, uh, he's the man that's responsible for the American radio industry, 1920s. Uh, five different companies own the patents for radios, and none of them would cross patent each other. And Herbert Hoover put him in a room, and he said, guys, this is bad for the economy. This is a new technology, and we need to develop it. He says, I'm going to give you two choices. You come up with a way to cross license, or uh, if you can't cross license, uh, I'm, we're going to nationalize all of your patents. Okay. This is Herbert Hoover. And you know what they did? They said they formed a patent holding company. And the name of that company was Radio Corporation of America, RCA. That's the origin of RCA. Okay? So originally, it was a patent holding company. Western Electric, which was part of AT&T, was the manufacturing arm. And then two or three years later, they started manufacturing equipment in their own name. And what they did is they formed a patent pool, and they allowed any company in the United States to uh, build a radio under their patents for, I believe it was 3% of the selling price, which was a very nominal amount, okay? And that led to the explosion, really the beginning of the technology industry in the United States. So Herbert Hoover uh, was, a, uh, in his time, a brilliant technocrat, and he said, he said a delegation to this show that if the United States is going to be a leader, or at least uh, an important uh, member of the world community, we have to be up on the latest events. So we sent the delegation, and amongst that delegation, amongst that delegation was a man by the name of Cedric Gibbons. Cedric Gibbons uh, was a, uh, a set designer in Hollywood, okay, and in his, the course of his life, he would go on to be nominated for 38 Oscars, and he won 11, okay? So this is a man that has a huge influence on, uh, uh, on, on American movies. A name you often don't hear, and he came back, and he said, I'm really interested in introducing this architectural style, and he introduced it in this movie called Grand Hotel, and this is not really a lecture about Art Deco, but I want you to realize that as you're looking at the scene, the co-star in this film is this Hollywood set. Now, by the way, the Grand Hotel is not a real building. This was uh, not on the film on location. But if you know the use of uh, Art Deco, the use of uh, natural materials, the steel, the wood, uh, the stone, I just want you to see as he sweeps through the lobby how he used that material to introduce the building as really a co-star. Look at that model. Whoa, Hollywood set. Oh, and this film had a huge cast, by the way. John and Lionel Barrymore, Brenda Garbo, uh, 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 a big, big cast. This was a very, very big film. People saw this, okay, and there was a demand now. There was really a demand, first of all, for materials that were art deco, uh, and also in the movies in general, okay, people started to realize that architecture can have a role in uh, defining a movie. Now, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, films were very, very rarely filmed on location. Uh, uh, I could be wrong, but the first film that I can think of that was really filmed on location was The African Queen. Okay? Uh, maybe some of the audience could come up with an early one. And by the way, oh, here's an interesting thing. I can't, I can't, I can't not say that. I don't know if you realize it, but The African Queen, the actual boat, uh, what, what town is it in? Uh, Isla Mirada? Key Largo. Key Largo. Key Largo. Largo. So, if any of you are film buffs, and you want to actually go on the island, on the uh, African Queen, it's a Key Largo. And for about $50, you can go out on a cruise for a couple of hours. My wife and I did. It's a great thing to do in Toby because it's a small boat and you won't be surrounded by a lot of people. So the actual African Queen is a tour boat from Key Largo today. But anyway, uh, we'll be still on the 
location was uh, what were quite unusual uh, in those days. Uh, 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 in the 1920s, it was hard to film a film on location. The film wasn't very sensitive, and they wanted to control everything in the studio. Okay. By the 1930s, when sound was introduced, the uh, implementation of sound, that was a lot of extra equipment, made a lot of noise, it had to be waterproof. So you don't really find films starting to be filmed on location and really until about the 1950s. This is a film, this is a clip. Uh, this is an establishment scene. So earlier I told you what an establishment scene is. It's a scene that tells you where you're going to be looking at a location. So in this film, uh, moved over location, uh, the bulk of the film is shot. The bulk of the film is shot uh, in a film studio in Hollywood. However, uh, however, there's an establishment shot at the beginning. And I'm going to show you this establishment shot because there's so much information in it that somebody who was watching this film at that time would have understood that you wouldn't understand today because a lot of things have changed and you don't realize how much things have changed over 80 years. Hotel. 
and uh, Carl Fisher to brand that hotel. And it's not really clear whether these were native or whether he imported them, but he had a, a, a flock of pink flamingos that were on the lawn. And that became very, very branded for Miami. So they showed that there, okay? Uh, they're going to the Flamingo Hotel. Uh, and you're going to see, I'm going to point out, there are actually some flamingos in the scene uh, decades later at the Fountain Blue. We're going to get to the Fountain Blue. We just, uh, we're working our way uh, chronologically up uh, through that uh, uh, through that uh, time. Uh, so, so and, and you know, I have to tell you, some people still remember this. I, I, I was doing a tour, and somebody asked me, I thought there were pink flamingos in my app. Okay. My wife and I did go to Hialeah during the summer, the racetrack, which doesn't have races anymore. It's just a drab gambling casino. Uh, but they do have pink flamingos. Here. So, uh, another thing that's interesting about this film is the name of it was Turn Over Miami. Uh, that's from a song, from, I believe it's about 1935, and this is the logo of uh, Miami Design Preservation League. And if you notice, our logo is moved over Miami. It doesn't have the words in there. So we're actually still picking up on this, uh, on this uh, theme as well. Now, the branding of Miami is so popular that sometimes films have been branded in Miami and they're not actually shot there. So the film, Some Like It Hot, the plot of that film, probably everyone here has seen it, but, but the plot of that film is that two musicians uh, watch the St. Valentine's Day uh, massacre, the murder of gangsters in Chicago, and they flee on a train dressed as women performers to Miami. But that was actually shot at the Del Coronado Hotel in uh, San Diego. Uh, okay. There isn't a single, and the whole film is shot on, on that, on that, the whole film, 90% of the film is shot on location at supposedly Miami. And they tell you, you even, I should have pulled this out, okay, from the film, when they drive up, because they, they gave it a different name, when they drive up to the hotel in, in, a, in, a, in a van, it actually says on the van, Miami. So they, they, they wanted you to know they were in Miami, but they never stepped foot in Miami at all. The other thing is that, that there are some scenes at the end that are on the beach, and you can see islands off the beach, okay? okay? Uh, of course, there are no islands off the beach of uh, uh, Miami. That's how it woke up right here. I'm going to show you one more, film, one more scene. Oh, now, the other thing that filmmakers sometimes do is they'll take a, 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 a building, and that building at that time has meaning to people. Now, this is another case where that meaning has been lost. Okay, so the Seagram's building was designed by two very, very famous architects. Mies van der Rohe, by the way, was one of the directors of the Bauhaus School. The Bauhaus School, I'm sure everyone knows, was a school of design in Germany. It was open from 1919 to 1933. The Nazis closed it because the Nazis did not approve of modern architecture. Uh, uh, and they converted the building into a training center for young Nazis. Today, the, uh, that school is uh, a museum and an education center. Uh, my wife and I also had the pleasure of going there a couple of years ago. So Mies van der Rohe was a famous architect, Philip Johnson, very, very famous architect. And they designed the first glass skyscraper, the kind of building that almost every building looks like today, uh, the Seagram building. And at the time that it was built, nobody had ever seen a building like it, right? Today, most people don't even know the name of the Seagram's building. But at the time that it was built, it was the most expensive office building that had ever been built. And this film, the best of everything, the opening scene is this young woman is going in to work for the first day. And everybody would have known what that building was. And, and, and here, they show the address, 375 Park Avenue, that is the address of the Seagulls building, which is still standing. So here, what they're communicating is that she's working in the fanciest, the most exclusive location in New York City. Finally, we need to get to the, to the uh, uh, Fountain Blue. So the Fountain Blue was up in an area, uh, that, that area, the little block of it, is called Billionaire's Row. Some people think that, that that area was called Millionaire's Row because today the condos cost a million dollars. But that's not really the reason. The reason it was called Millionaire's Row is that when there were real billionaires there, they were what today we would call billionaires. 
you know, the, the value of money isn't what it used to be. And this was an area that Carl Fisher, when he was laying out Miami Beach, he laid out uh, just north of where we are, okay, he laid out uh, a, a very exclusive area for the richest families in the United States, okay, where they could have large beachfront properties. And that was pretty much the case for a good portion of Miami uh, through the 1930s and 40s. But by the 1950s, uh, uh, these people started to sell off the property. The real estate became much more valuable, okay? And these estates started to go. Most of them moved to the Palm Beach. So the people that used to live in these houses like Firestone are more likely, those families or people in that income bracket are more likely, not that we don't have our share of rich people in Miami, Miami <laughs> Beach, but people who want to live like that are more likely to be up in the, uh, the Palm Beach, okay? But the Firestone, so that's for Harvey Firestone, was, you may know that the name of the tire company. He's the person, well, the Firestone family invented the technique uh, uh, vulcanization that, that uh, uh, made uh, tires as reliable and as good as they are, built the tire company based on it, and he had a beautiful uh, uh, property, you know, uh, here. Now Miami, by the way, is a small town. I don't know if people realize, you know, you can do things here that would never happen anywhere else. You know, Saturday, Friday night, I was on a podium shaking hands with the mayor of the city. I lived, I grew up in New York City. I never met the mayor in New York City. And and I was at a, a, a synagogue event once, sitting with, with uh, some people that I didn't know. And there was a woman who's a generation or so older than me. And she told me that she, when she was a little girl, one of her classmates said, oh, would you like to come to the beach at my family cottage? And she said, oh, that would be lovely. When she arrived, she found out that this was the family cottage. Oh, wow. she, her, the, the child that invited her was the granddaughter of Harvey Firestone, and this classmate had no idea, you know, the person I was talking to, that the person that was inviting her. This is what, what a small town uh, it was, particularly in those days. So, in the 50s, this property got sold off, okay? Now, that looked like a big house. But look at how small the house looked comparison to the construction site, okay? And, and, and if the Seagram's building was built to be a building uh, where cost didn't matter, if there was such a, such a building, the Fountain Blue was a similar building. The, uh, the, uh, the owner of it wanted a building that was going to make a statement. He wanted the building to be the building that was going to represent uh, Miami, Miami Beach in the minds of people. So it started to be built in 1954. I'm going to give you a little bit of history about that architectural period. 1950s, and a new attraction was added, the Destination Resort that's Hotel. The you look at a place to sleep, these hotels became the venues for the dream vacation. Visitors relaxed on the beach or poolside during the day. At night, they dined, danced in glitzy ballrooms, and were entertained in nightclubs without leaving the hotel's lavish premises. Tropical Miami Beach had an architectural Okay, so this is a clip from a, a longer video that Miami Design Preservation has. And I wanted to give it to you, have you see it, to contextualize that, that uh, uh, these, this hotel, uh, more than any other hotel, was the first hotel that when you stepped foot on that hotel, you never had to leave it. Every service that you wanted, you could have here. You didn't just come here for entertainment or for sleeping, okay? When the hotels that were built here, further down south, most of these were just dormitories. If you had been on our, if you had been on our tour, you probably know that there were no restaurants on Ocean Drive until the 1980s, when our founder, Barbara Kappenman, came up with the idea of promoting this area by putting restaurants and bars in the hotels along Ocean Drive. But this hotel was built with multiple restaurants. We're going to we're going to see more clips of it. Multiple restaurants, shopping. We're going to talk about shopping. You can do your dry cleaning. Okay? To us, that doesn't seem unusual, but you know, you could just 
your dry cleaning your lawn, you leave it out by a bag by the door. You can come there, stay there for an unlimited day, had a house stop. You could stay there and stay for an unlimited period of time, and you never ever needed to leave the premises. And that was a new concept, the concept of a hotel that you never need to leave. Morris Lapidus was the architect that was hired to do that. He was introduced a little bit here. Our exhibit here is about him. Okay. Uh, I'm only going to say a few words about him as an architect. Uh, but believe it or not, the uh, uh, Fountain Blue Hotel was his first uh, project where he designed an entire building. Prior to that, his career actually, he was a store designer. He was designing stores. And then, in the late 1940s, uh, uh, owners of hotels that weren't happy with the way that hotel was being designed would hire Morris Lapidus after the hotel was already built and he'd say, I want you to snazz up the interior. I want you to make it something special, okay? And, and, and that was where he built his reputation. So the Fountain Blue was the first time he ever actually got to build the whole building. Now, I have to tell you, I'm not okay. I remember going to department stores in the 1950s, this particular set, in the Morris Lapidus from the, that's in Chicago, I, I believe. So I don't think I ever saw this. But I remember as a child that I would go to uh, uh, stores like Macy's, uh, and you would come in, and there would be these incredible displays like this, where there would be free-form shapes, and there would be offset lighting. And I have to tell you, I, I come from a, a working-class environment. I'm, I'm not, you know, my parents were very good parents and encouraged us, but they didn't have a lot of money. Our house was kind of drab, okay? And, 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 and I understood that when I walked into a department store and I felt the grandeur or something like that. I mean, even as a child of eight or ten years old, I remember experiencing that. So the Fountain Blue Hotel was built. Uh, uh, it's completed by 1956 or 1957, and immediately becomes iconic. So I'm going to show you a couple of scenes from this film. This is a film, uh, A Hole in the Head, 1959, starring uh, Frank Sinatra. No one wants to come up right now. You see that? Did you hear what he said? Jerry Bob told me he wants me to go to his party in the Fountain Blue Hotel. You wouldn't understand that. He's my kind of people. <laughs> and we're going to pick that up at the Fountain Blue. So this is the fountain. That gentleman is following the mayor. He's lying, but I don't recognize him. And we're going to keep following. Disneyland was announced that they were going to Orlando. 
So it shows him two things. One, that this area was already so decrepit that people were talking about knocking it down. And two, that the Disneyland that opened in California was so successful that the Disney organization was talking about an East Coast uh, uh, location. And ultimately, I think they decided not to come this far south because the land was so cheap. I mean, and they, they ended up in Orlando. I remember, I was like, 1966, I was 13. I remember when they announced it, and I was thinking, where in the world is Orlando? I never heard of that place. Okay? And I couldn't imagine at the time when they put it in the middle of nowhere. But now we see why. But they were actually thinking about putting it, or I shouldn't say they were thinking about it, but the premise of the film is that the real estate here had so little value. People no longer, why, where did they want to go? They wanted to go to have hotels like the Fountain. I'm going to show you another interesting scene. Okay, so uh, this is actually the Hollywood set that was set up on the pool deck to build the scene you just saw. Okay, can everybody see that? That's the diving board at the back, the pool. Okay, so it appears in the scene that they're in a cabana. That's what it's supposed to look like. But I suppose that the real cabanas were probably too small and perhaps uh, 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 didn't have the right lighting. So they set up a full cabana to film the scene. So this is actual filming of the scene that we just uh, that we just witnessed. Now the fountain blue it, uh, uh, is so big in the imagination. Uh, at, at that time, it so came to represent uh, Miami that when Elvis Presley left the army, his first concert was at the Fountain. And at that time, now Frank Sinatra is more been associated with the Fountain. We kind of had an, an arrangement with him, and I'm going to get back to that. He had an arrangement with them where, uh, where he was a, a performed there often. Okay, that was good for him, and it was great for the Fountain. Blue. When, when Frank Sinatra, that was the only hotel Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack stayed in when they came to Miami Beach. Now, most of you, I'm sure, are old enough to remember Elvis Presley. I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few things about him. Okay, in the 1940s, Frank Sinatra was the biggest singing star in the United States. I think that's fair to say. In the 1950s, Elvis Presley was the biggest star. Okay, and then I think eventually, in a few years, he gets eclipsed by the Beatles. But at this point, he was still riding high. And in the middle of his most successful part of his career, he was drafted into the United States Army. Uh, and I have to say that he um, uh, served honorably and in good nature. I've read reports that people that served with him, they said, you know, he went through basic training. And then after a while, they realized he had more value for uh, morale, and they had him doing some singing tours. He also managed his career very well. He pre-recorded songs before he went in the army, they were released while he was in the army. No war against that, okay? So he's released from the army, very honorable service in every level, and, and the concert that was held to uh, to reintroduce him to the, to the American public was held with Frank Sinatra in the mountain. In a way, in different areas. Sand, 
let's be critical of the tourist day. The day that could never get started without the people who provide the services that are required in order that the local winds will get out. The people who serve are the real backbone. The people who serve and work in order that you might pay. That is the Okay, so again, I'm just giving you samples, okay, of, uh, uh, but the, the film is it's literally an hour and a half of the fountain blue uh, uh, in this film. And I give them credit because obviously they were laughing at themselves. But my favorite is Goldman, okay? That was a very big film when I was a kid, okay? This is the second scene, I believe, but this is really the scene that kicks off uh, the film, and it starts with... Uh, 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 this is what we're going to have. So that's good. You need a rock Goldfinger was an architect, 
uh, a modern architect. He was also working in Europe. He was also a refugee from the Nazis. So he came to Britain in the 1930s, 1933, and he developed modern architecture uh, building. And in his time, he was very, very uh, well known. Uh, he's particularly famous for this building here, Two Villa Place. Uh, this is in a neighborhood called Hampstead. And Hampstead, if you've been to London, is an older section of, uh, of London. The houses were built in the 19th century, okay? And to show you what most of Hampstead looks like, this is a typical scene in Hampstead. These are 19th uh, century buildings. And uh, Goldfinger bought the property that I just showed you. That property today, by the way, is uh, what they call a grade one listed property. That means nationally it cannot be damaged. We don't have uh, a status like that in the United States. We have the National Registry of Historic Places that's honorary. In Great Britain, if you're a class one, you can't knock that building down. It's also a museum, part of the National Trust. Great Britain operates 500 museums, and this is one of the 500 museums. And my wife and I also had, had the pleasure of touring that some, some years ago. So the, the architect, uh, his name is uh, Erdo Goldfinger, built this building, and there was an uproar in the neighborhood. It was built in the late 1930s. Uh, uh, Ian Fleming lived in that neighborhood. So he made his character's name, Goldfinger, as an insult to, to, to the real Goldfinger. And the real Goldfinger sued him. This actually went to court, okay? And in, but the court proceedings did not go well for Mr. Goldfinger because what, what uh, 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 Fleming said, what Fleming said is that how could you confuse the two characters? The real Goldfinger was tall and handsome. Okay, the whole figure in the series is short and fat and, you know, kind of, kind of homely. Okay, so they eventually, and, and, and uh, uh, Goldfinger's friend, Goldfinger, you know, like many architects, uh, uh, was quite conceited, and, and, and his friend said, let it go, let it go, and, you know, people will forget about this, but he, he pursued the suit, and they eventually settled for one pound and ten copies of the that was the sound. Okay. And an apology from uh, Ian Fleming saying that in no way did he intend for this character, mind you, Erno Goldfinger and Oric Goldfinger. Okay? No way did he intend for that character to have been uh, uh, copied after the real Goldfinger. Now, what amazes me is how could you be from Britain and not know that? Okay? Okay? So I always tell that if I have one English person on the tour. Now, this is a TV series that was. I shouldn't say it was shot, okay? They do an establishment at the opening, they do an establishment scene, and then when they film it, it's a very funny thing, they have, they have the, the, uh, the uh, fountain blue as a background, uh, but they're actually filming, the entire series, except for the opening, is filmed on location in a studio with the, with the, uh, with the uh, fountain blue as a backdrop. So this was a TV series, in the early 19, uh, uh, 1960s, Okay, so that was a series again and trying to locate it, to try to brand it, and all they have to do, I don't think they ever mentioned the words Mountain Blue in the series. They didn't have to, okay? Everyone knew what that building was, okay? Now, you know, unfortunately, there's also some dark sides to our history in Miami Beach, okay? Uh, uh, many of you may know that uh, many hotels were not open uh, for, for, for Jews in the period, certainly before World War II. That was never the case with the Fountain Blue, the builder of it, who loved that thing. I believe he was Jewish, but it certainly the hotel uh, was open. This is a hotel, by the way. This is a matchstick. I bought this on eBay. The Broadmoor, that's on, this, on the corner of 75th and Ocean Terrace. Still the Broadmoor, still there. Okay? They were a little more blunt than some other people. Catering to a giant clientele. Okay? They're letting you know who's welcome and who's not welcome. Okay, uh, there is a connection to this to the Fountain Blue, not because the Fountain Blue denied entry to Jewish people. I'm going to get to some other issues with the Fountain Blue in just a moment, but 
But in 1939, there was a ship of refugees from uh, Nazi Germany, Jews from refugee, the refugees from Nazi Germany. They had permits to land uh, in Cuba. And when they got to Cuba, uh, the government uh, revoked those permits. Uh, the ship then came to Miami, and it was um, uh, anchored off of 44th Street, right in front uh, of the Firestone Mansion. And the Coast Guard surrounded it with a flotilla of ships because they were concerned that, a per that people would jump off the ship. They were only uh, a, a mile or so, less than a mile off, off the shore. They were concerned that people would jump off and swim to the shore. And they didn't want anybody. And at night, and at night they had searchlights all on the boat in case somebody tried to do it at night. There was an appeal to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt refused to allow entry. There's a documentary, if you want to know more about that, called Complicit. And the purpose of that documentary, the theme of that documentary, is that Franklin Roosevelt was put on trial for the crime of being complicit in the Holocaust by not allowing this ship and doing other things that could have, uh, have been done. What happened to these people? We went back to England. About half of them were able to get off. Uh, my wife and I, we have a friend whose mother was on that boat. About half of them were returned to Nazi Germany, and almost to a person, they all perished. Everyone that was returned to Nazi Germany was killed by the Nazis. The history of, of, of this area for black people is even worse. Uh, 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 all of the beaches in Miami Beach, up until 1945, every single beach was off limits to black people. You didn't need to post a sign in front of a hotel and tell black people that they weren't welcome because segregation was the law and everybody knew what the law was and it wasn't even necessary to post it. But believe it or not, things started to change during World War II. Uh, and for black soldiers, and I can understand some of this uh, ambivalence, I think for black soldiers, there must have been some ambivalence. We're serving in the U.S. Army to fight fascism and, and racism, and yet we're going to face racism at home. And they came up with a slogan, double B, victory of, at home, victory of Roy. And it's really the beginning of the civil rights movement, as we know it. It's really the beginning of the civil rights movement. Uh, what, what happened in uh, uh, February or March of 1945, there's a swim-in at Hologa Beach, one of the first non a violent protest in the civil rights movement. There's a swim in, and a group of blacks go into the water, okay, and decide that they want to uh, uh, challenge the uh, uh, challenge the law. That's whether they can swim or not. And uh, they tried to get arrested. They tried to get arrested, uh, but the police in Miami were, were too smart to arrest. If you remember the civil rights movement, as I do, you can remember water hoses on people and all kinds of horrible things, okay? The police here, they let them swim. The swim was over, everybody went home. Then, six months later, Virginia Beach was opened up as a colored only beach. Now, that was considered at that time a victory. Remember, the law at that time was separate but equal. So I'm looking at it from the eyes at that time, so from 1945 on, Virginia Beach became a beach that was available. Prior to that, if you lived in Miami and you were black, you had no beach that was available to you. Okay? Uh, and in fact, people that were that went there had very good memories. I'm not I'm not justifying separate but equal. I'm simply saying that it was good to have a beach and they had cabanas and it was really a spot. What happens, of course, is that when segregation ends and people can go anywhere, that beach fell into disuse, but uh, in relative disuse. At the Fountain Loop, uh, earlier I mentioned that there was a group led by Frank Sinatra called the Rat Pack, okay? Uh, uh, Joey Bishop, uh, uh, Peter Lawford, uh, Dean Martin, uh, and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. were members of this. And Frank Sinatra had a deal with the, with the Fountain Loop that he could perform he would perform for free, but he and his friends were caught, complete, rooms, food, everything they wanted whenever they were at the Fountain Loop. But remember what the law was. The law was no blacks, the law, I can tell you this, the law is that blacks needed a permit 
to be in Miami Beach after 6 p.m. And the permit was issued by the police department, okay, at the permission of your employer. So you can only be here if you were employed at that period of time. So that was the law, still the law. We're in 1957, 58, it's before the Civil Rights Movement, before, I mean, the Civil Rights Movement is starting, but it's, it, it, nothing has changed here. Segregate, this is the South, that segregation was the law. But Frank Sinatra said, uh, I have to tell you that this is, uh, I don't have a good source for this. Uh, when I'm a tour guide, sometimes I say I've been told. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna qualify this with that, and I've been told. Because I tried to find a source for it, but I couldn't. But I've been told that Frank Sinatra said, if Frank, if Sammy Davis Jr. doesn't stay here, then I don't stay here. And then the management uh, uh, backed down. It is known that he did stay at the hotel. Okay? This is a picture of Frank of Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, having dinner or drinks at, uh, at the Fountain Blue. I don't know the exact year, probably late 50s. Uh, Early, uh, early, uh, early 60s. So that was a chink in the armor, okay? But it was a very, very small chink. Now some of you may know this film, One Night in Miami. Uh, uh, if you don't, the plot of that film is the night of, in Miami that Mo, uh, Muhammad Ali had, the night before the fight that he won the uh, championship, the world championship. And another connection with Miami is that uh, uh, Cassius, uh, Muhammad Ali was training uh, at the Fifth Street Gym in South Beach. Now, it's not the same Fifth Street Gym we have now because they've moved location. But the Fifth Street Gym was a very, very famous gym. Famous enough that Muhammad Ali uh, uh, trained there. But he wasn't allowed to sleep in, in Miami at that time. So he actually was sleeping in a hotel called Hampton House. And Hampton House today is a museum, and I'm actually ashamed to say, Barbara, we have a visit, okay? And it's right in our backyard, and I really need to go there. So it said, uh, it was actually based on a play, and then it became a movie. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of scenes from this. Say when they came to my money, that it was yours to do. To do with as I please, Angie. And if it pleases me to bring my friend down to give me the spiritual support I need to win this fight, then that's what I'm going to do. They want their money back, I'll pay it back to all of them. With interest after the fight. Now, if you all will excuse me, I'll see you back there now. Don't you ever Unfortunately, I don't believe it was filmed on location. I believe it was filmed in New Orleans. This scene picks up. You know this building, right? Again, it's so iconic, they don't have to introduce it. This is a continuation of the same scene. Uh, a friend of his was Sam Cook, the performer, and this is Sam Cook with his wife. Now, what's interesting here, Sammy Davis set the precedent. At this point, Sam Cook is performing at the Fountain Blue, and at this point now, they're allowing performers that are black to stay at the hotel. It's no longer challenged, and this is the early 60s, they're giving him VIP treatment. It's implicit in the film, never stayed. So 
glad you watched this scene. I want you to notice how there's no beach water and how close the ocean is to the fountain. So keep that in the back of your mind as you watch this scene. We hope that that will open right in to the ocean. that happened here over the years is our beach uh, uh, diminished. Uh, and in 1980, the Corps of Army Engineers signed a contract to replenish the beach in the entire East Coast, starting at Miami Beach and ending in Maine for 50 years. That project started about 1980. Here you are in 1982. Uh, that hotel, I think it's actually a condo hotel, that's about the 50th Street. So the fountain bloom would be somewhere in that, in that, just south here, about six blocks. I don't think it's really visible in the picture. But I want you to see what the beach looks like, replenished and unreplenished, okay? We were down in many places just to a little uh, beach strip. Also, we have something to worry about. The contract for that ends in the year 2030. Now, in 1980, 2030 seemed like a long time ago, okay? But in 2022, it's really just around the corner. Nobody's talking about this. I haven't seen it a single art article about it, but that's why our beaches have been replenished time and time again. They've been replenished over and over because of that contract. And there's a formula that I think the federal government pays a certain percentage to the locality, but it's a big, big subsidy that we're receiving to get this beach replenished. And you can see in the old film how little beach there is. Up, it says Marielle Cuba. Scarface was a Marielle, 
okay? And what happened is, uh, in the United States, there's a, uh, um, an assumption uh, of, of innocence. You're innocent until proven guilty. The criminals, and I want to focus on the criminals. The criminals went on, criminals did what criminals do. They take advantage of people that are physically weaker, okay, or intellectually weaker. And they went on a crime spree. And they, where did they move to? They moved to the, poor, the poorest sections of town, Little Havana and Miami Beach, which was already in decline. And they made both areas very, very hellish to, to, uh, to be in. So if you're a, now think about it from the point of view of a Cuban. Hundreds of thousands of Cubans came. The vast majority are doctors and dentists and business people and laborers and housewives and students. And yet, when a, the only film, the first film that was made about Cuban immigration, it was about a thug, a thug who didn't even exist. It was really a remake of a 1930s film, Scarface, but it was updated to a more modern uh, community. So this was very, very, I shouldn't say controversial, this was very, very painful to the Cuban co uh, community who felt that they were honorable, who are honorable people that are making a contribution and they were being smeared by a film. The problem is that nobody wants to make a film about a baker who goes to work at the door of the Okay? They want to make a film about a thug like this guy. So here's a short clip. You can find the rest of this on wolfsonarchive.org. Mr. President, it's important to make a decision by filmmakers to go ahead and release more films. It was hard to hear that, but when, this was a, uh, a clip on, on the local news, and what they're saying. Uh, is that uh, the community, Cuban community was protesting, and despite their protests, uh, they were moving ahead with uh, producing this film. And they were very unhappy about it, and I can understand that. Now, another thing I told you about the Fountain Blue is that once you left it, you didn't have to leave it. So they built the Fountain Blue in a shopping arcade. They encouraged people to come in shopping. So what did that mean? And of course, other hotels, the Fountain Blue was the first, but it wasn't the only one. Other hotels copied that, and what happened? Uh, what happened? Uh, the uh, uh, Lincoln Road started to go into a decline. So Lincoln Road hired the same architect, uh, Morris Lapidus, to design the uh, 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 Lincoln Road uh, arcade that we have now. So that was really Morris Lapidus competing against Morris Lapidus. They said, you're so good at drawing people in, maybe you could draw people in to here. And you see that this is actually the Lincoln Road in a film called Birdcage. Yes, the structure. Uh, 
accessible at the fact. And then there was a film, War Dogs. This is about some nobodies that got a billion dollar contract that they couldn't possibly, uh, with the U.S. government. They got caught, they made a lot of money. They got Congress had an evidence to contract that case study. All that is wrong. And when he's going to spend his ill-gotten money, he goes to the back of the little hotel. No one knows what it's like to be the best. 2022, the KUI, the LG, and once again, to be on federal contracts. And finally, uh, uh, this is an autobiography that Morris Lapidus wrote, okay? Uh, his theme was, too much is never enough. Again, this wasn't really an architecture talk, but if you want to know about Morris Lapidus, the person, his own challenges, this is probably a, 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 a good source. I will tell you one more thing about Morris Lapidus. Uh, at the time that he was designing these buildings, he was very unpopular with other architects. They considered this excess and extravagant and really in bad taste. Okay, which is why he, he wrote this autobiography, Too Much Is Never Enough, because he felt that excess was something that the people could enjoy. Okay, thank you very much.
the C? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Yes. 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 Which area? Well, you know, I, 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 I hop off my bicycle, lock my bicycle in front, and walk through the, the uh, fountain pool. Okay? You can walk through the lobby, you can walk in all the public areas, okay, uh, up to the pool area, okay? Uh, I wouldn't try to go on an elevator to go up to a room because, you know, if, if I were a hop police, I would think somebody wearing a bicycle have would probably suspicious, okay? But, but yes, that hotel. It, it's completely open. The public areas are completely open. My wife and I once went there. Oh, maybe we'll get something to eat. Well, it turns out the only thing we could afford was ice cream. Two ice cream cones for fifteen dollars. So, but it has five or six restaurants. Okay, if you want to pay those prices, they're they're open to the public. Any other questions?